Hi, it's The Wire. It's March the 30th, 2021. Wealthspinning.blogspot.com, a free site. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Let's talk money. But please, do not consider this to be investment advice. Right, I'm just offering some thoughts, some investment ideas for entertainment purposes only. I want everyone here to think for themselves and to consult their own financial professionals. I'm just sharing what I'm doing. So remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. First, I'm buying the dip on silver here. I don't know what's going on in the market. People seem to have reached a conclusion that the precious metals no longer matter as much as they do. So rather than pay a premium above spot price, you know, I want low prices. And because I'm willing to have silver in a vault overseas. Well, I get to accomplish both by going to Volturo.com. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O, -O, Volturo.com. They now sell silver. So they're fully audited. You could look at the audit records at the website. Um, so you can buy silver. They'll allocate the silver for you in a vault overseas, right? It's a great way, great way, quite frankly, to give yourself a hedge on crypto. Not only that, they accept crypto. So if you have Bitcoin or Dash that you're willing to convert to silver, you can do so quickly with very low transaction costs at Volturo.com. Let me also say, too, that with all this big push for DeFi and with the mess, and that's what it is, that has become of Ethereum's fees, I personally believe that Ethereum is just a transitional technology, right? I tried to do a transaction the other night on Ethereum. They wanted to charge me close to $30, and I was not moving that much money. I thought it was an outrage, right? So given the number of competitors to Ethereum, let me just repeat my long-held belief here. Bitcoin is far superior to Ethereum. I even question whether Ethereum is going to dominate their side of the market. Right? Cardano is going to come out with smart contract capability uh, in the coming months. You have several other competitors, several other governance coins. Um, Cosmos, for example, Polkadot, Kusuma. Kusuma has been on fire. As I've mentioned in other videos, you can get 12% on your Polkadot investment and on your Kusuma investment if you stake with Kraken. Let me point out too that I'm not a paid spokesman for any of the companies I name here, right? I don't have a deal with Volturo. I don't have a deal with Kraken. I'm just going around the cryptoverse and I'm just picking great deals that pop up from time to time. Well, let me just say, I know DeFi is all the rage right now. I want people to consider the more centralized DeFi part of the equation, right? I mentioned Binance coin, BNB. It's now over $300 a coin, folks. Understand it's deflationary. They're not talking about it. It's already deflationary. Now... I, I get the idea that Bitcoin holders, and I'm a Bitcoin holder, are upset that Binance coin is not decentralized. 
I'll agree with that, but understand that Binance is one of the most successful exchanges in the cryptoverse. It's extremely successful. They have a bit of credibility here. They've already announced that they're burning coins. Right? I just get the feeling that it would be brand suicide for them to betray users by suddenly changing course and making the coin inflationary. Let me also point out, too, that Binance Smart Chain charges fewer transaction fee costs than Ethereum's fees. Right? It's possible that We started out cryptocurrency seeking decentralization. Now we're realizing that too much decentralization might be a bad thing. That some centralization can actually lead to some efficiency. So what I want people to consider is, gee, who's going to own the future? This DeFi world where sushi swap suddenly shows up and there's a question about the chef taking money and stuff like that. Some DeFi world where you're hearing about lower fees, but when you're actually on the exchange, the fees are higher than you expected. Right? This DeFi world where the thoroughput is not what it should be where you start to think about the idea of bad actors messing up an altcoin, right? Hard to do with Bitcoin because Bitcoin has such a big hash rate. But some of these altcoins don't. And then you start to realize, wow, aren't they more vulnerable to attacks by outsiders? Right? How decentralized is it when people could take money off a DeFi exchange and then supposedly return it later. So, let me just say this, uh, and I'm talking about the people running the exchange. Right? So, I'm actually open to Binance Smart Chain. I'm open to BNB. It's run up nicely for me here. I've mentioned it in a prior video, it continues to run up today, right? Um, I just like the idea of the greater efficiency. And apparently I'm not alone because the demand is increasing. Let's talk about another coin that deserves your attention, and it's a deal that deserves your attention. Did you know that right now on Gemini Exchange you can stake Filecoin and get a 7% rate of return? Now, for those following, Filecoin's been on fire. The coin's up around $150 right now. Right? Or, excuse me, let me take that back. The coin's at about $150 right now which is a huge increase on where it was. If you do some research on Filecoin, you'll find out that Filecoin is being used by so many people that the memory demands in the system are huge right now. This coin seems to have caught fire and is on the way up. Let me also tell you, too, it's the Winklevoss twins who run Gemini Exchange, which legally operates in all 50 states of the United States. Right, folks? That includes New York State, which has some ridiculously strenuous cryptocurrency regulations. And believe it or not, Gemini has met that legal standard. So, on one of crypto's better exchanges, they're giving you 7% interest on one of crypto's hottest coins, and I believe this coin has legs, 
right? Food for thought. Let's just back up a second now and talk about the general economy. You know, I know that they're printing a lot of money. I know that the Biden administration, after a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, now wants an infrastructure bill passed that, according to reports, is going to cost more than $3 trillion. Hey, I'm a child of the 1970s. I remember the inflation. Right? I remember when Wall Street was viewed as a backwater in the late 70s, early 80s. Right? I remember mortgage rates well into the double digits. Treasury rates well into the double digits. Let's face it, the 80s and since then have really been a story of declining interest rates. Just imagine in the early 80s when inflation was rampant, being able to get a government bond that paid 15% interest for more than a decade. Think about that. Well, let me just point out, I lived through that era. I was a little kid. I thought inflation was just a way of life. I was stunned to find out later that it wasn't always that way. I was even more stunned as an adult to actually see inflation get tamed. I remember Jimmy Carter with whip inflation now buttons, right? Well, let me just um, say this. Are you sure with all this technology that we're going to get inflation and not deflation? Don't you need a hedge on inflation expectations just in case they don't happen? So what I'm going to do is to just talk about one business that I believe is going to have a lot of job losses. It has already because of this ridiculous pandemic, right? Um, the restaurant business. <clears throat> I was out with a bunch of people at a restaurant the other day, right? There were kiosks on the table. There was a QR code on the table. That's how you were supposed to <clears throat> get the menu. They didn't have paper menus. They expected you to take out your phone and scan the QR code. Then the menu website would pop up on your phone. Well, I was sitting there and I was looking at the setup and I thought, well, why even have the kiosk? In fact, isn't this a great way to pass the cost from the restaurant on to you, the consumer? Right? Understand, each of us had a cell phone with software that could fulfill the role. All they had to do was have a QR code with a menu that was interactive that allowed people to order. Right? Understand, if the restaurant doesn't even need to have a kiosk on the table, they're shifting the cost of having a kiosk onto you, the consumer. Now keep your eye on the real ball here. The waiter has been disintermediated. In other words, I show up at the restaurant, there's a QR code as it is on the table for me to get the menu. I don't need the waiter to get the menu. Right? We're seated at the table. You can, with a kiosk, punch in separate bills for everyone, right? If you're not savvy enough to use Square Cash app and transfer money to people and stuff like that, you could literally just say, hey, I'll have my own bill. You have your own bill. She has her own bill. You can do that now. Again, no waiter is needed. You don't have to tip extra for the waiter's brilliance in remembering the three or four checks at the table in addition to 
the different dishes, right? Let me also say that in the crypto world, we believe in prepayment, right? You pay, then you receive. It's kind of like a fast food model where you go into a McDonald's and you pay, you wait, you get your burger, right? McDonald's knows that you've paid because you have to pay beforehand to get your burger. Well, I imagine if the credit market collapses and folks, there's a lot of debt in the system, right? If the credit market collapses and we have a problem with credit, some restaurants are going to flip the switch, right? They're going to say, hey, you have to pay beforehand, right? Whether you tip us afterwards is up to you, right? Kind of like Walmart home delivery. Whether you tip us is up to you, but you need to pay for the food beforehand, right? And so understand, with an interactive menu and the technology already exists, Lord knows when you're online, you're using interactive features on websites, aren't you? They can have buttons by the food choices. So you just order the food just like you would on a kiosk at McDonald's. You order the food. You make the payment because, of course, you have, you name it, PayPal, which gives you access to crypto now. You have Cash App, right? Understand, on your phone, you could pull up something powerful, right? Kraken, which has several different currencies. Uphold, which has several different currencies. You have payment services now that can convert whatever you use into whatever the restaurant uses if conversions necessary. So, Tesla, right now, in the EV market, has said, hey, if someone buys a car in Bitcoin, we're just going to keep the Bitcoin. Well, understand, you could have restaurants with that same attitude. If the menu's interactive, then the menu can actually change the price right, based on some price index, if there are fluctuations in the price of the currency, right? Let me just uh, say that the cost savings are huge. Not only are you completely cutting down on the need for paper menus, right? In some cases, kiosks equipment, waiters, waitresses, right? But you're also getting rid of the cashier, aren't you? Understand this world is coming. Right now the world we're in has paper currency. I think we all know that even states are moving toward digital currency. Right? In China, they're already there with the WeChat app. So just think it through. In addition to the cost savings, again, no menu, no cashier, no kiosk, far fewer waiters, right? quicker ordering time. But also think about the information that the restaurant will be able to receive immediately in computerized form to determine their own inventory demands and supply chain needs, right? You have immediate market research because everything's digital. The owner of the restaurant can just say, hey, how many people ordered the filet mignon this month? And boom, there it is, right? Understand too, you're disintermediating banks if you're not using credit cards, if you're using cryptocurrency, right, you don't need the clearing services that you had before. The restaurant is getting paid 
faster. They're not waiting for Visa to process their payment. Although in fairness to Visa, Visa apparently now is using Ethereum to process some payments, right? So Visa's up upgrading. Let me also say too that you have fewer advertising materials that are needed because people are interacting with you through their phones. You can have a website on which you also have your menu and everything else. Right? You don't need billboards around town. You don't need print ads in newspapers that no one is buying. So think it through. If this is more efficient, in terms of its use of capital, world develops, folks, you're going to have falling prices because the people who print the menus, they're going to be without a job. Right? The waiter who used to come by your table several times, not just to drop off food, but to check on you and to hear your special requests and to earn a tip by writing down your order, that job will no longer be necessary. Right? Some of the market researchers will no longer be necessary because the restaurant will know in real time what people are ordering in databases that they can search. Let's also talk about ownership. Right? Let's say the restaurant is tokenized. Right? It doesn't have to be a chain. It could literally be just that location, just that restaurant. Right? If it's tokenized, then customers can literally own a share of the restaurant. And if it's all digital, you can automatically receive your dividends. Right? Automatically. Because since it's digital, your digital share would be in a database and smart contracts could kick out to you whatever your share of the profits is. Right? Understand, too, if you own a share of the restaurant, the restaurant could even get funky and give you discounts on the food in the restaurant. In other words, the distance between the people who own the restaurant and the customers might actually be blurred to such an extent that that restaurant that they call your neighborhood bar might actually be owned by the neighborhood. You might even be able to vote in corporate elections electronically. They'll send you your proxy or whatever right through the smart contract. Something like Polymath. Look up that cryptocurrency. Right? This might even make it less likely that a restaurant that might be doing well, but not might, but might not be doing spectacularly well. That the neighborhood values, right? It'll make it less likely that that restaurant closes because the restaurant would be owned by people in the neighborhood, right? So the point of this is simply, you can't have runaway inflation when you have technology that is inherently deflationary that's going to disemploy many people. A lot of people are going to be displaced. Right? You're not going to have you might not have. I'm just giving you the deflationary point of view. The one bondholders prefer. Right? You might not have runaway consumption because people like the waiter, the kiosk manufacturer, the menu printer might lose their jobs. Right? Might have to regroup. Won't be robust consumers. Understand, the money supply is increasing by leaps and bounds. 
but velocity is not. I would encourage people to uh, look up uh, The Price of Tomorrow. The author is Jeff Booth. I would encourage people to go on YouTube, look up Jeff Booth, look up Jim Rickards. Right, so right now, I understand. Interest rates are jumping. I get it. I understand that probably the best way to play, you know, inflation might be owning stocks and property, right? Okay, I uh, get that. But I'm just not convinced, given the deflation that we've had caused by technology, the fact that taxi drivers, for example, are no longer needed thanks to Uber and Lyft, right? That's literally solved the taxi cab problem in several cities, right? Given that remote meetings are now obviating the need for commercial real estate, just imagine how deflationary that is toward real estate prices in these downtown areas. I think investors need to consider the possibility that even with all this money printing, you might still end up with increasing bond prices, lower interest rates once this little step up subsides and you need to be ready. So the idea that people are giving up on gold and silver, in my opinion at least, is simply preposterous. When you're in times like this where prices are changing on the level that they are and where people are just assuming that once everyone gets vaccinated, then they're going to be back out, packing arenas, right? Sports numbers are down big. They're going to be back out, packing restaurants. That no one is going to say, you know, during this pandemic, I learned to use DoorDash, Grubhub, right? You know, I started getting my groceries delivered home from Walmart, Amazon. I don't even want to go back in a supermarket. I'm not ready to go back in a restaurant. Right? Just understand, the economy might not rebound the way people think it is. Right? We might not be headed to inflation anytime soon. As an investor, you need to think about that side of the argument. Maybe it is inflation that rules the day but also be prepared for deflation. So when you see the gold price drop below $1,700 an ounce, in my opinion, that's a buying opportunity. I encourage people to think about ways to acquire gold and silver without paying the huge premiums that you have to pay now at most places. Uh, the way I'm doing it is uh, one way is on Volturo.com. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.